live by the word. That might be good out in the desert of the world, but when you come into the oasis of the church, you're going to get life, you're going to be fed, you're going to find out the truth, you're going to find out how to be delivered. Amen. First Corinthians chapter four, verse 12. I do not know how people can have church in 30 minutes or 45 minutes <laughs> and really let God touch people and people get touched. I don't know if you'll realize that Sunday morning there was just a powerful presence of God in here. The anointing of God was in here Sunday morning. Just many testimonies. And, uh, you know, I, I do try to be time conscious. But, you know, God wants to love on his people. Amen. Amen. And, and so we have to be available to do that. That's part of our worship for God. I know some people say, well, I want to go visit. But how long does that mass last? <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. And some of y'all just... Kind of say, well, uh, about, about 11.30. Uh, we're out before 12, usually for sure. <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, sometimes I feel like I have to rush to, it, because of time conscious. And I, I'm aware of that. But at, at other times, it's like God is really doing something in some people's lives. And, and what I want the church to get to know is if you do have to go, I'm not offended if you have to go. But for those that are pressing in and staying, then let's press in and stay. Amen? Amen? And, and we're going to try to teach that and make that clear. Because I know that there's some things that people are doing. And, and uh, you know, they have to be certain places at certain times. And so whenever someone gets up to leave, you know, and we shouldn't think any less or more about it. We should just go on. But I tell you what, have you all learned since you've been here that the closer you get up into this area the stronger the anointing is? Have you been in church long enough to realize that? And there's I'm nothing bad about sitting back in the back corners or whatever, but when the Holy Spirit starts to pour out things and the waterfall is falling right here, guess where you want to be? You want to be right here. You're kind of asking Him to bring His waterfall to where you are when He's already pouring it out. You know, there, there's healing that has taken place tonight already. And I believe there are absolutely some people that should have been here that are not here because they got distracted today that is missing out on some healing. And it's not just their fault. There's an enemy that stops us from being where God wants us to be. And so be aware of that. Now, this, this scripture in 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Say faithful. faithful. Now that word right there means to be trustworthy, to be loyal, to be consistent, which brings me to the scripture in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, to be like Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? And, and so we should be striving to become consistent, to be loyal, to be faithful, to be trustworthy. And in these last days and the times that we're living in in the world and the things going on in the world, there's a real enemy that wants to stop the church, stop the message of the gospel. Have y'all realized that? I mean, Miss California just gave her opinion this week and people came unglued. I mean, they, they, it's like you cannot even have a biblical opinion anymore. I'm sorry, but I'm still going to preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad she stood up for what she believes. Amen. And I wish you would know that there's probably a lot more people that agree with her than disagree with her. Amen. Amen. So as we're beginning to move forward in the things of God, we're going to run into an enemy. Have you noticed how there hasn't been much unity in the body of Christ? Have y'all recognized that? There's a lot of churches that don't even have unity within their own church. A lot of gossiping, backbiting, 
you know, griping going on, uh, criticism, uh, independent spirits working in the church, and, and just within the single church. But let, let's take a look at the body of Christ as a whole. And, and right now we're, we're, we're divided a lot. And we need to learn that God's going to bring us together to accomplish something awesome. But let's start right here. Let's realize that we need to be in one accord. And for that to happen, all of us need to be found faithful, trustworthy, loyal, consistent, loving one another the way that Christ loved us. These are the two great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, so mind and strength, to love one another. Amen? Amen. And uh, so that at the end of the race, when you read Matthew 25, 21, he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So now I want you to go with me to Psalms 133. This was the assignment I gave those who came to the Sunday night Bible study. I said, y'all go home and read Psalms 133. Now, I want to talk a little bit about unity tonight. The importance of unity. And what's going to bring that unity is if each of us has a loyal heart, a faithful heart. Now this is a beautiful chapter. Psalms 133, verse 1. It says this. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Some, somebody say unity. unity. God likes it when we're in one accord. Amen. Amen. And because there's power when we get in unity. When you're in, in a marriage, isn't it good to be in one accord with your spouse? Being faithful, loyal, consistent in your love for them. I mean, there's power that comes out of that. When you're unfaithful, not trustworthy, it doesn't work very well, does it? So, so this is a picture not only of the church, but even... To strengthen your family, you need these same principles to work in the family and everything you do. So God says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Then he says this, it's like the precious oil. And when we talk about the oil, what are we talking about? The anointing. The anointing, the power of God. He says when we're in unity, it's like the oil. Upon the head. Now we know the head of the church is who? Jesus Christ. Amen? He is the head of the church and he's anointed. And then it comes down. See, it says running down. So God has an order of things, doesn't he? Christ is anointed, then he anoints the leadership of a church. Then it, it talks about, it says coming down on the beard. A person with a beard is a mature person. So talking about the mature people in the body have that anointing. It comes on the head, it comes down the beard. It says, uh, the beard of Aaron. It's talking about the ministry there. Aaron was the high priest. So the anointing's on Christ and it gets on the leadership and it comes down on the ministry. But how many of you know it doesn't just stop there? It's not just the ministry that's anointed. And it says, running down the edge of his garments. That means it goes all the way to every part of the body of Christ. This is a picture of the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We are all members of that body. There's leadership in that body. But there's somebody that's all the way down. You're just the hem of his garment. But let me tell you something. There was a woman with the issue of blood for 12 years that said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be what? Made whole by faith. So y'all, some of y'all might just be the hem. But when you leave here, you are anointed. Say, I'm anointed. And so when people touch you, they should be getting a, a touch from God. So, so where does this come from? Unity. So we, we want to work on having unity. Unity in our families, unity in our church. Then, I'll, then it says, it's like the dew of Hermon. Descending upon the mountains of Zion. Now, dew, how many of you ever uh, got wed by dew before? Now, do you know that the ground is dry, and then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, it's wet? It's not like you hear the dew come. It's gentle. It just kind of sneaks up on you. 
I can remember when I was younger and, and I was in martial arts and I do a lot of running. One time I put some moccasins on, got me a, a little backpack with, a, with, with a, a, a blanket and a pillow and I took off running. I lived down spring by and I went sleep on uh, the eighth hole of the golf course over there, the green. And when I laid down to go to sleep, I was dry. And when I woke up in the morning, I was soaking wet. The dew just came on me without, it, it didn't like wake me up. Or not. And you know, the anointing is the same way. If you'll just be where God wants you to be, it'll just, without you realizing, it'll just come on you. And next thing you know, you're going to be soaking wet with the, the anointing. You ever been going about your day and it's all of a sudden you just feel the anointing? So where did that come from? Well, that's what he says. He says, when we're in unity, the anointing is on the ministry, it's on the body of Christ, but it'll also just fall. It'll fall across this whole parish. Amen? And God begin to destroy yokes and remove burdens just like the anointing, like, like, like this dew. People are going to wake up, they don't even know why something's changing, but something's changing. And it says, it says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. Say the blessing. What is the blessing? He tells us right there. The blessing is life forevermore. Now I want everyone watching on television, everyone that's here to realize that the blessing is not houses and cars and lands. The blessing is eternal life. And that life is in his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what unifies us. You know what's going to make us powerful and strong is when we're united in Christ, united in His Word. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. I hear the Bible pages turning. <coughs> Ephesians 4 1. When you get there, say amen. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. That means putting up with each other in love. That's kind of how we would say it. Bearing with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we have to work at keeping unity. you got to watch out for the gossipers, the backbiters, the critical people, the ones that on Sunday when they leave from here, they have fried pasta for lunch. Amen? All they can see is the problems or the flesh. Or, you, the, we need to be in the unity of the Spirit, led by the Spirit. Amen? And so he's telling us, walk a walk that's worthy of the calling. Be humble, be lowly, be gentle, be, have long suffering. That means you're going to have to bear with one another and put up with one another. But do it in love because God does that for you. He loves you. Amen. And he says endeavor. That means work at to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. Say one body. Now. There is really only one body of Christ. Do y'all realize that? On the entire planet, there's the universal body of Christ. And I guess it's made up of many different denominations. Would y'all agree? Now, some denominations think that they are that body. But I'm telling you, in every church, they got members of the body of Christ. Amen? So there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, amen, not two lords, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Somebody say praise the Lord. So we want to have the unity of the Spirit. That's the first thing we want to do. Endeavor to be of the same mind, same spirit. Amen. So, so when you see something going on that you don't understand, Stick around. You'll understand. We'll finally get around to teach about it so you'll have a good understanding of it. Now go to verse 11. 
for the sake of time. He says, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So there's the fivefold ministry. Say fivefold ministry. These are the ones that are going to teach you the things of God. Amen. And he says, what did he give them to us for? Look at verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, who's the saints? Believers. He's not talking about all the dead guys that are already going to heaven that everyone votes on and says that now they're a saint. Do y'all realize that? He's talking about all of those who are born again and believe in Jesus Christ. So don't wait to die to become a saint. You are a saint once you've been born again. Somebody say amen. amen. Now see, that's biblical interpretation right here. This is how you interpret the Bible. We don't all, not, not all denominations interpret this thing the same way. Okay? So the living apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and I happen to be a, a pastor teacher, okay? I'm doing something. I'm equipping you for the work of ministry, for the edification or the building up of the body of Christ. It says, till we all come into the unity of the faith. Say unity. There it is again. God wants us to be in the unity of the faith, believing the same thing. Now, how do we do that? You've got to get into the same book. Now, I'm so glad that y'all read all kind of books. You might read Joyce Myers, Kenneth Hagin, or, you know, uh, John Eldridge and all these other books. But let me tell you, you've got to put that down and you've got to get into this because this is going to be the book that's going to produce unity. Because they're talking about this book. This book will speak right to your spirit and to your soul. Amen. Amen. And faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not just by reading somebody else's material. Now, enjoy reading other people's uh, material because they spent their whole life, and you can learn reading a book in, in a week what they spent 30 years learning. Awesome lessons. But that's not what's going to produce unity because we found out, and, and I'm not going to read it all tonight, in 1 Corinthians, there were, some were saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm, I'm of Paul. Uh, I'm of uh, Cephas, and they were all divided because they were following different teachers instead of following the teaching. Amen. So our final authority here is the Word of God. Amen. So you have the right to, to disagree with my teaching if it disagrees with the Word of God. But if it's plain Bible and you disagree, then you have an opinion that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Now, see, this, this is where we lose our unity in the body of Christ. Because in America, everybody has an opinion. Amen? Everyone comes to church with their own opinion. But I want to ask you something. When you've got an opinion about something, and then you hear the word preached, and then you go home and open it up, and you find out what the word of God says, and that word says differently than your opinion, are you going to keep your opinion and say, well, that Bible's just out of date? Because this Bible says very plainly that marriage is between a man and a woman. But if you have an opinion that two women can be married and two men can be married, that's your opinion. That's not Bible. Can I have a better amen than that? Because you're not going to find that other opinion in here. Do we love all people? Oh, absolutely. I love, I love everyone. I love them so much that I'm going to tell them the truth. Right. Amen. For this reason, a man shall leave his father. A father is a male, and his mother is a female. That's how he got there, by the way. How about that, huh? And be joined to his wife. His wife is a female, and he's a male. And that is the biblical picture of marriage. So I say go, Miss California. Because other people have a lot of opinions. But what does the Word of God say? Now, if you can show me in the Word that my opinion about this is wrong, don't just come tell me, well, God wouldn't do that. No, don't give me all your... Show me the Word. Let's get back to the book. Because I'm going to be a preacher of the Word of God, the Bible. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, uh, correction, reproof, and... and, and uh, well, let me go read it. I'm misquoting it. 
Sometimes I can quote it, but it's true. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is, is given to us to teach, to learn. So for us to have unity, we've got to have a final authority. And the final authority is not Pastor Mark's opinion. Somebody say amen. amen. It's what the Word of God says. Amen. I don't want to preach my opinion. I want to preach the Word. Amen. I want to be ready in season and out of season. Amen. There's going to be people that's going to have all kind of different opinions. But listen to the teaching of the Word by anointed apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and they will bring you to the unity of the faith to the knowledge of the Son of God. So let me ask you, who are we looking for when we're teaching out of here? Jesus Christ. This book is a book about Jesus Christ. Amen? And Jesus Christ has a wife called the church. Amen? Now see, some, some, some of y'all went off right there because y'all been watching too many, too many Da Vinci Codes and all that other kind of stuff. We are the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen? So us men, we got it cool. We get to be a husband if you've been married, and we get to be a bride one day. You ladies only get to be bride and a bride. But listen, he says, verse 13 of Ephesians 4. He says, till we all come into the unity of the faith. Now that takes work on the part of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers of the leadership of a church. To the knowledge of the Son of God, we don't want to preach ourselves, but we want to preach Jesus Christ. To a perfect man, and he was the perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We want us to grow up into the fullness of who God called us to be. No longer being children, tossed to and fro by every news media, every doctrine, everything that somebody says, everybody's opinion. We're not going to be tossed to and fro by all of their opinions. We're going to get back to the Word. We're going to live by the Word. That might be good out in the desert of the world, but when you come into the oasis of the church, you're going to get life. You're going to be fed. You're going to find out the truth. You're going to find out how to be delivered. Amen. No longer uh, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. All these different teachings. By the trickery of men. How many know they're out there to trick you? By in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. And they are deceiving so many people because people want to love pleasure rather than love God. And if you do not have a love for the truth, the Bible says you will be turned over to a strong delusion. Let's go there. Go with me to uh, Thessalonians. Uh, I'll, the scripture just came to me. I want, want you to see it. Uh, second, second Thessalonians chapter 2. And look with me at verse 9. I'm going to start with verse 8. I'm going to start with verse 7. No, I'm just kidding. It's all good. Amen. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Now I want you all to know that the lawless one, we know that there's going to be an antichrist, but there are, the spirit of antichrist is already here, and there's many people already proclaiming lawlessness against the word of God everywhere you go. How many of you all realize that? Amen. The lawless one is already being revealed. Man apart from God. Man who will shake his fist at God and say, I don't need you, God. I'm going to live my own life the way I want. In fact, look with me at, uh, at verse 3. I'm going to take you a little deeper in some things. Y'all want to go a little deeper in some things? I'm going to show you something here. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now let me help interpret that for you very plainly. He's saying that this lawless one, 
This, this man of sin, and I want you all to know something, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So just think for a moment. The man of sin is Adam, the fallen man. I know there's going to be the Antichrist one day, but the man without God is a man of sin. And you know what that man of sin does? He wants to deceive the whole world, and he wants to sit in the temple of God. What is the temple of God? Your body is the temple of God. And he doesn't want to worship anything that's of God. And he's going to say, I'm the God of this temple. I do what I want, when I want, the way I want. I'm God of my own life. And you're not going to tell me who I can be with, can't be with, or whatever. That's a man of sin. He shakes his fist at God. He, he's, going to, he's going to rule his own life. Can you see that in that scripture? Listen now that I said that. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. They think we're foolish for worshipping God. So that they sit as God in the temple of God. As long as you're the God of your life, then Jesus isn't the God of your life. You're going to have to die from being Lord of your own life and let him become the Lord of your life. Are y'all getting this? I hope you're getting it, okay? And it says, and sits as God in the temple of God to show himself that he is God. How many of y'all know what the number of the beast is? Y'all tell me, y'all know? Six, six, six. What is the number of man? Six. Man independent from God, six, six, six. Man in his full manifestation, independent from God, shaking his fist at God, saying there is no God. I'm God of my own life. I don't submit to anything. Now I'm kind of spiritualizing. I'm using allegories to open your mind up a little bit more. To, some of y'all think that one day somebody's going to be walking around with a 666 stamp, stamping people. There's people already walking around living apart from God, shaking their fist at God, sitting in the temple of God, saying that they are God right now, and they have the spirit of Antichrist right now, and they are against the body of Christ and against the church. Now, the stronger the enemy gets coming against us, the more unity we're going to have in fighting back. So don't be afraid of what you see in the world. All it's going to do is cause the sleeping giant of the church to rise up and become who God's called us to be. Come on. Did any of y'all ever see the Lord of the Rings? How many of y'all saw Lord of the Rings? That movie. Now I'm going to kind of give you a movie. At the end, Frodo. How many of y'all know Frodo? He had that ring and he was going to throw it in. And, but he needed some time. All of the armies. Humans, gargoyles, I mean, all of them weird looking. All of the ones that was on the good side finally all came together. The king even resurrected some of the dead ones. If you remember the movie? And they all stood together in unity and line and were ready to give up their lives just so that Frodo would have time to get that ring back into that fire and so that evil would be defeated. So what brought all of them in unity together? It's an enemy that they knew that if they did not stand against it, it would crush them. They either were going to be wimps and die, or they were going to fight and die. Now think about what it's going to take to break all of the walls down in the body of Christ. So we get fearful of the things of the world, but let me tell you, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love, and of a sound mind. And I tell you, it's, it's not bad enough yet for all of the churches to start coming together. But one day it might be. In, in Argentina, I think it was Argentina, one of the South American countries, this pastor was trying to get all of these other pastors together to pray because of the cartel and all of the drugs and all of the, the killing that was going on. This was years ago. To, to try to, to get them together, come against it. And he could never get them together. But he continued to fight against it the best he could on his own. And you know what happened? They murdered him. They murdered him openly. All of a sudden, all of the pastors came together. They started filling stadiums with people, worshiping and praying and praising God, and began to transform their nation. By the power of God. But it took a martyr. It took somebody willing to die. It, they, they realized, you know what? If, if he killed him, then I'm going to be the next one. 
Are we going to run as the body of Christ away from the enemy? Or are we going to run and defeat the enemy? So unity is going to be absolutely important for us as a church, and not only that, for us as a community. And I don't care what's on your door, on your church. We need to quit fighting against each other and come together. That doesn't mean come join this church. That means we need to understand that we serve the same God who died for us, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and was buried and was raised from the dead. And it doesn't matter the name on our door, the color of our skin and all those things. But those who believe in faith, by faith you're saved. Your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have to start coming together. If we stay divided, we're not going to have any power. And I'm not talking about being political. I'm talking about being spiritual. Somebody say amen, because I don't want to get involved in the politics. I might have to, but some people may have to rise up and do that. But you know what? If we'll be spiritual, God will take care of the rest. Is this making any sense to you all tonight? But what is it going to take? You must be found faithful, loyal. Loyal to the word, loyal to your church, loyal to your leadership, loyal to your husband, loyal to your wife, loyal to walk out this, this beautiful gospel. And I didn't even get to the scripture I wanted to read yet. I preached something else. Look, go, let's jump down real quick. Look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So don't chase after signs and wonders because the devil's going to be able to do some of those. You better get a hold of the truth, this word. With all unrighteousness and deception among those who are perishing. Y'all with me? Verse 10. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They're perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth. Oh God, I want to love the truth. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. That they should believe the lie. In other words, if you don't want the truth then you're not going to be set free. You'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you don't love the truth, then you'll believe a lie. You'll believe all of these, these things. Amen? You know, sometimes I want to know, I wonder how plain I need to get. I mean, they said, well, you know, if, if, you know, two ladies get married, they need to so that they can raise their children. How did they have children? How did two men have children? Let me tell you, there was a woman and a man involved if there's a baby. I mean, amen? amen. I mean, that, that's, that seemed like God's plan, amen? If you're going to have a baby in the nest, it's good. that's the only way. I ain't figured out any other way. They said, well, it was artificial insemination. There was still a dude somewhere. <laughs> amen? Or there was an egg somewhere. There was something somewhere. And we know these things to be true, but we'll believe the lie because we don't love the truth. And so when people hear, hear me, they're going to say, well, I'm intolerant, I don't love, I'm unloving, God, would, God, loves, every, God loves everybody, he died for everyone. And let me tell you, you're welcome to come here. Amen? Every sinner, and I was one, Saved by grace is welcome to come here. I don't care what your lifestyle is because I know this will change your life. Amen. This word will change your life. In verse 12, and we'll end with that, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's some strong stuff. As we say in Spring Bayou, ay ay ay. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you've done tonight. We thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, as I stand here tonight, I still feel your anointing very strongly in this place. And I pray, as I spoke out of Psalms 133, that the dew of heaven would fall upon our community, Lord would fall upon central Louisiana. And that anointing would begin to destroy yokes, remove burdens, and bring unity and healing to our land. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. 
You know, the Word of God says, and Jesus said this, He said, I am the bread of life. He says, your fathers ate the manna in the desert, and they died. But the bread that I give you is for eternal life. He says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And he said, that bread is my life. We need to learn to eat of his life, his word. That is also a picture of taking the body and the blood of Jesus in communion. Receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Becoming one with him turning from the things of the world and turning to the things of God. You know, God loves you, and Jesus Christ came to save you. I want to encourage you today to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You know, Jesus came so that we could be restored to the Father and have a relationship with the Father. So if you want to restore yourself to God, you simply need to pray a prayer, something like this. Say, Heavenly Father, I repent of all of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead. I believe in the resurrection. And today, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to be my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. Come into my life today in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer in sincere faith from your heart, I believe you are now a child of God. You need to get involved in a local church. There are many great pastors, many great churches. You may already be part of one. Become faithful. Serve in that church. Let God use you right where you are. If you don't have a place, if you don't feel like you're being fed, your needs are not being met, I want to invite you to come here to Christian Family Worship Center and be part of what God is doing here. We'd love to serve you, love to teach you His Word, and love to help you walk out this life of faith. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today in Jesus' name. And remember, God knows everything about you, and He loves you anyway.